Welcome to the Death Doula Duo. I'm Sarah Kovash. I'm Jennifer O'Neill. And this is where we explore the profound mysteries of life and all things death. Hello. Hi. We are here today with Violet and Rochelle. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about their experiences being close with somebody who was dying and how they were part of that process. And Violet and Rochelle came to our very first death cafe. And I was just struck by how their experiences were really beautiful and just how that encapsulated just my hope for people experiencing death and just the fact that it can, it can be a beautiful experience. That's a good reminder. Yeah. So I was just excited to have them on the show to talk about it and um, just get to share a little bit because death is good to talk about. Who wants to go first? Well, I can go first. I'm Rochelle. Thank you guys, by the way, for having me here. I remember the first time I came to your death cafe and it was such a profound experience for me. And it just warms my heart that you remembered my story and thought to invite me back to to share more about that and to share with others. So thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank thanks you. for coming. And I love Death Cafes because really anything can be talked about, whatever is on people's hearts. And it just so happened that that day we got to talk about your experiences. And that was awesome. What do you do for a living? So I actually do several things. Uh, I am a massage therapist. So that's my primary love. I also um, love water. So I have a business uh, selling water machines. And then um, I also lead guided meditations. Awesome. Full spectrum. That's really cool. It all ties together. Into like a purpose. Is that what you mean? Well, through the water, I always think about our bodies as... um, as being water on, on a 99% molecular level, we are water. And so, um, I, I thought a lot about spirituality through the lens of water and also working with people's bodies and their water bodies. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, we can channel through water and our solar plexus is a water channel. So we're, we're able to literally speak health into our body so, yeah, I've, I've been able to tie all of my offerings together through the lens of water. Awesome. Nice. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Violet, what do you, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Violet Benoit. And I uh, also would like to thank you for inviting me today. Um, I was at the First Death Cafe and really um, brought up a lot of stuff for me that I've never got to really share with people because it was such a personal experience and I felt so safe in that environment to discuss it um, and then to get to hear about Rochelle's experience as well and know that I'm, a, I'm not alone. Um, and uh, there was a medium there who also shared that she deals with this all the time. And so it was really exciting. And I'm really glad you guys are facilitating these types of events here locally. I live in Norman. I work for a nonprofit, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and I recruit for mentors for kids. And so we always have a need for that to make a difference in the life of uh, kids who need an extra pillar of support in the community. I have two sons of my own. I absolutely love um, being a part of, you know, these kind of things. I appreciate the opportunity uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thanks. So, Rochelle, can you tell us a little bit about your spiritual experience and just, I mean, were there specific moments or sensations that stood out to you during that experience or just an overview? Well, if I can give a little bit of context of why we were even there in the first place. Um, so, my grandmother, what I'm actually speaking on today is my grandfather's passing. Uh, his passing was who I was actually present there for. My grandmother had passed away two years prior, and she too uh, was on hospice, just like my grandfather. 
So I was very prepared for many of the things that happen during the, during hospice and a person's final moments. I was mentally prepared for the physical changes and all all that was you know going to come with that. With my grandmother, uh, I got to see her on her last day. Uh, my kids and I went and said uh, our final goodbyes, and then she passed shortly after we left. And that always made me sad and always wished that I had been there with her during her final moments. So when my grandfather, two years later, um, was going through his hospice journey, I I felt like it was important to to be there. And I did not want to miss his passing. So uh, towards the end, um, my grandfather lived. He was a very, very vibrant man. He was very, very active. And all up until really after my grandmother passed, it was kind of like her passing. He kind of gave up on, on life. And he really just wanted to be with her. And so it wasn't long after her passing, he was diagnosed with um, brain cancer. And he did initially seek out treatment. And then, I don't know, after six months into it, he decided that he was just ready to be with grandma. And so in honoring him and his, the way that he wanted to go, we were all very supportive. And uh, so once we got him signed up for hospice, things kind of took a turn very quickly. And we saw my grandfather, who's this very vibrant man. He was a he was in the military and he carried mail in Mustang, Oklahoma for years. And now this man could barely function. So there was a day that my cousin and I, um, she and I were like, my cousin was the person who was primarily taking care of him. And she was exhausted. We were all exhausted and he was too. And he just kept saying things like, I'm ready to see grandma. And he was starting to see relatives come in um, <clears throat> and talk to him. And he was sharing with us these conversations that he was having. And my grandfather um, is Baptist. So he also was talking a lot about Jesus and um, that Jesus was sitting with him. So he had a lot of visions towards the end. Um, but this, this day finally came where my cousin and I went. We sat outside and we prayed to my grandmother and all of our ancestors, you know, please come get grandpa because he was tired. And it was literally an hour after that, that um, 911, we had to call 911 and they came out for the final time. Him being on hospice, they don't actually take them, you know, to the hospital. And so he was from that point forward, never did get out of bed again. And we were told by the hospice nurse that he had a couple of, um, days left. And he actually ended up making it six days, which was just incredible. We, we think, we think it's because we were hanging out. There were family members who weren't normally together and we were all there with him in the house. So the things that happened from, from the prayer that we sat outside and, and, you know, that seemed to help ease him into his final, you know, moments of being in bed, of being in bed. Um, so towards the end um, was when a lot really shifted and where it, it seemed, it's very challenging to explain, but it, you could almost feel like the room was heavy with our ancestors. Okay. Yes, it was like a party was happening and you could feel everybody coming for him to be there with him as he was... Um, transitioning. Yeah. And I just want to say, I mean, not to interrupt you, but I just feel like what you're sharing is really relatable. And, yeah. and, um, even about going back to your grandmother's passing, mm -hmm. I thought about my grandmother's passing a lot because I stayed at the hospital with my mom religiously every single day. And then as soon as I went home, with my dad one night to like shower and sleep and whatever, that's when she passed. And so it was like she, looking back on it, I realized and hearing other people's stories, realizing that she probably chose that moment because yeah. she knew it was going to be too much for me. And I didn't think it would be at the time, but looking back on it, I, they gave me the opportunity to go see her body. And I mean, I walked in and I had to walk right back out because I, 
just couldn't deal with it. And so I'm sure she knew on some level. So I, mean, I think that it's, it varies. So yours, she waited till you left and other mm-hmm. people wait until certain people show up. Definitely relatable. When my grandmother passed, when we had gone to see her, I, in, with her situation, I literally, her, my children and I were the last people. She, she did wait for us mm-hmm. because it was literally moments after we left. Um, there was a huge rainbow in the sky. And my daughter says, Mom, look, I bet that's Grandma's bridge to heaven. Wow. And literally within moments, we get a phone call saying that Grandma had indeed passed. And, you know, so the rainbows have been very, very symbolic. So we know that she very much did wait for us. And, you know, and it, it still though left me with this feeling like if I have an opportunity to be there with someone, I definitely want to be there. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's beautiful going into your grandfather's. And mm-hmm. so that kind of leads into the question of how did this experience impact the way that you deal with death? I mean, it, it impacted mm-hmm. you by making you want to be present. Yes. And very much, very much um, with with that to with, with being present. You know, the the other thing that I that I did want to mention, too, uh, as far as like the sensations, his actual the moments of his actual passing. um, It was in the morning. My aunts had come in and said, oh, we think grandpa's gone. So my cousin and I it was four of us two of my aunts, my cousin and I and two on each side. And we ran in there and he actually waited for us, too. They thought he had passed, but he actually we saw his chest rise and fall three more times. And so we were all just telling him how much we loved him. We were we were cheering for him and um, just telling him it's okay to go and you know congratulations and um, and he he hadn't smiled or made any facial expressions and right before he took that last breath he had the biggest mm-hmm. smile on his face and it gives me goosebumps right now to 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 think about that. And so that moment, that moment was the most profound moment for me in knowing um, and, and, and alleviating really my, my fears of what, what comes next. You know, he, he really was truly at peace. And um, so I, I would for sure say that it has allowed me to see death in a, in a different way and, and, in a, in a way of excitement. That's beautiful. Yeah. And he also was 88. So I do have that as part of the context. It's a little bit different than, you know, if, if he were my child or something like that, you know, so he did have a very full life and I am super grateful that I was there for that experience. Well, and how you described the room even prior to that, with the heaviness and everything and how you and you just- could feel it lift as the smile on his last breath you could feel the room just kind of lift and it was almost like every going up yes it was like everyone was with him and they were like we've got you you know we have you now yeah and then that some of the things that happened directly after were, were really incredible as well so like angelic yeah. type yeah, well, immediately after my cousin smokes cigarettes, so she wanted to go outside and I went and sat with her and we had this old boom box and I lit a candle. So we were playing some of his favorite songs and it was the first time I had ever noticed that a candle flame, like the, the fire actually will dance to the music. It changes. I think it's the frequency, the vibration, the, vibration, the frequency. Mm-hmm. And so I was noticing this candle, but then this huge gust of wind came. And I just knew, I knew that was grandpa's like final goodbye. You know, it's this huge gust of wind and whew, yes, that, that was, that was super profound afterwards. Yeah. And what stands out to me is that you, you all allowed space for yourselves to experience that rather than like having to rush to go do something or something else. You just allowed it to happen and allowed yeah. yourself to experience it. I like the the part that you cheered him on. Mm-hmm. I think that that is a beautiful way to handle someone's death that is pretty unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I would like to welcome more of that sort of yeah sort of mm-hmm. thing. I think that fight against death is 
Overrated. It is overrated <laughs> for sure. Well, once you've experienced something like that where you you can actually feel the celebration in the room, mm-hmm. how can you not cheer them on? Right. You know, and I and you see other people and they're so down and sad and mm-hmm. and you can just tell that they're not connected to what's actually happening. They're just they're thinking still about their own loss. They're thinking and, about their own loss and what they've got the you know, the things they have to get in order and more worldly things. Which is okay. I mean, yeah, I think grief is, I mean, part of it. So, grief is but, a thing. But mm-hmm. I do see, I do see what you're saying. It's a whole different, yeah, if you feel, if, if you you're able to do it that mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your experience, Violet. Well, my experience was quite similar in that celebration aspect. Um, my, this was my uh, dear family friend who I considered an uncle. Um, I grew up with him all my life since I was a little girl and, um, he had gotten liver cancer. And, um, at this point now he was pretty far along and was, um, just, they had him hooked up on pain medication in his house. His brother was watching over him and he was in a bed, uh, just basically waiting out his time. Um, and I had this, um, you know, I had gotten a call that said, if you wanted to go see James, it might, this would be a good time. Um, and so I went out by there in the day and um, went in. And I remember um, as soon as I walked in the room, it was like it was a shocking experience because physically he looked very ill. His skin was all turned yellow and he was not present at all. Um And so it just hit me like this really intense um, pressure. And I hit my knees in the room and I just closed my eyes and I started going into prayer. And um, I just started doing a series of real intense prayers and I felt his spirit in the room. And it was just, it was large, larger than life. And I remember his brother was sitting at this desk doing his taxes for him. And he was just grumbling and upset and very down and depressed. And the house had this very darkness in it. There was this depression in the house. But his spirit, which no longer was in his body, was like in the room, was so large. And it was uh, it was just pure light. And I remember just um, as I prayed, connecting to that and started feeling the energy of his spirit um, and his readiness to pass on. And I remember thinking, Um, that I was there for a reason. And the reason I had been called to be there was to help him uh, to call in the ancestors. And I didn't, I've never done that before. It wasn't something I'd read about. It was just like, this is what you're here for. And I was like, instinctual, whatever I need to do, I'm available. And so, because I would had been doing these prayers and then I started calling, all these names came to mind um, of friends and family who had passed on before. Um, that I hadn't even thought of, you know, the, it was almost as if I was being assisted. And your guide was guiding you to mm-hmm. to help him. Yeah. And it was just very, like, I didn't have my eyes open. There was no, like, this was all just a very um, spiritual experience. And I'm on my knees, I'm on the ground, and I'm just doing these prayers and calling in these names and asking for their help to cr- help him cross over. Uh, what we were thinking, I was like Rainbow Bridge, you know, was also coming to mind. And um, and all of a sudden, here comes these energies. Uh, I didn't see forms, but I felt them. They were very strong, powerful forms. And I felt the celebration, the celebration in the room. It was so joyful. And I remember like tears coming down through my eyes and just feeling this emotion overcome me of just gratitude and celebration and joy. And I remember thinking like, wow, you know, I was just so in, encapsulated in this moment. Um, there really was no uh, separate separation. I remember this reunion. It was like a reunion. And um, and then at, at some point I felt it went on for quite a while. It was kind of like a meditation, a celebration. And I was part of this. Um, but I was also kind of just not really in it, but, um, over here. And, um, and then I just remember feeling like my work was done and that, um, that was all I was here to do. And that, that, um, and I just remember feeling overjoyed 
and 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 this sense of relief. And I'm and I stood up and I looked over to his brother, and his brother didn't have any sense of any of that happening. You know, he was like, "This is just really, you know, unfortunate. This is crappy. You know, I've got to deal with all his paperwork." And, and you were able to actually witness what was happening. And I was had this experience that I didn't expect at all. That I'd, you know, I mean, I've had. Um, some metaphysical experiences in my past, um, but nothing like this is related to death. And um, and so it gave me a whole new perception. I wasn't expecting that. I was just going to be a normal person coming in to say my goodbyes, you know. Did you see anything of how, it, like with his body, did anything change or was everything kind of the same? I honestly, I could, I had a really hard time um, being there physically. Um, my whole perception had such, had been shifted so much that I really wasn't connected to him physically, like to the physical aspect of the situation any longer and, because it didn't even make sense to me. Like right. what he looked like there on it, his you knew spirit he was wasn't even, that. Yeah, yeah, his spirit wasn't even in that body. That body was just like, they were just almost keeping it going with all the medical, you know, things they had hooked up to it and stuff. And, but he was ready to go. And I think they, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but I think there was a few days before his actually, um, that his body actually, um, you know, completely entirely shut down. I hear that often that the preparation begins before we were aware. Mm -hmm. I mean, spiritually, at least that they're preparing way before the body actually gets to that point. Mm -hmm. So did you carry that message or that experience to anybody or did you, how did that affect you at the time? You know, uh, like I said, in the beginning, I really felt like that was uh, very personal and, um, you know, it wasn't something I would just go around and talk about. I kind of kept it between my spirit guides and I and, um, and then on certain circumstances when it seemed fit, you know, I would share it. I remember the first time you shared it with me and it was very impactful. It's funny how a lot of different things can happen to lead you into experiences. But that was, that was one of mine that just hearing your experience opened the door for me that, you know, death is more than what we can see. So it changed my whole life about death, like my whole perception. It was like, now I realize um, that this is a reunion and it's a, it's a celebration. Um, and I don't want to be at the same time callous about how people experience, different people experience death in different ways. Um, but I will, it changed me forever and I'll never look at death the same. Um, and it like, I just, I, it gave me a certain level of trust also. Um, in great spirit, you know, for timing, um, and for, um, support and, in an angelic or ancestral, um, or spiritual way that, um, because he was not, uh, a very, like a super religious person or anything, you know, so it wasn't that based on his faith of what he had, you know, this was just because he was, this is just how it is. Well, and I mean, he had things to learn in this life, mm -hmm. just like everybody else. And a lot of times that doesn't mean being connected to spirituality. He was very spiritual, I would say. And he even would talk to his guides and things. So, but he wasn't religious, you know, in that aspect. But I don't know if that makes a difference or not. It's hard to say. I just know that it, that, um, it gave me a level of trust that um, I have when people tell me that someone's passed or someone's passing. And, and I've had several other experiences as well with people close to me um, where I wasn't there for their death, but um, they um, contacted me shortly after, like within the, within the few days of their death and um, in, an, in an energetic way, um, in ways I could not deny because I wanted to, I wanted to be like, mm, that that's probably not happening. <laughs> sure. And it was like, oh gosh, this is happening. Mm -hmm. Like smack in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. What do I need to do? 
kind of reminds me of when my grandfather was passing. He was suffering pretty badly and I had not really gone through a, a death in person and I had some anti-anxiety meds at that time and when I started to get upset that he had passed, uh, my sister was like, take your medicine and I, I instantly was like, no, 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 no. I need to be a present. I need to be present and a part of what's happening and and I'm glad that I didn't because I feel like I got to experience his death in a in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise if I had tried to numb it in that way. I agree with that. Yeah. Cause it's almost like there was there is a level of anxiety that's involved. Um and it's it can be overwhelming. Um but I do believe that if that wasn't like you have to surrender to, you know, the experience and be present for it. I think that it makes a big impact and also just um having that level of like kind of the veil uh being thin and being open to that uh well experience having an experience with that and then I think at that time I was even had kind of one foot on the other side myself and it made me more um you know, viable for an experience like that. Do you mind explaining Um, what you mean by that? I was just, uh, I was going through a lot at the time myself. And, um, and I, I just, uh, I don't feel like I was in hundred percent, like plugged into everyday matrix reality. Um, And so whenever I, had this experience it was like I was it it just hit me it was like I had no defense against it you were open I was open yeah Yeah. so I mean I don't really go into it any more than that but I think that that may explain you know that you could kind of understand it I think that makes a big difference about being open and Mm -hmm. I I can relate with with that as well At, at the time of my grandfather's passing I was going through some heart some serious hardships with my own children and just other things as well. And so I too was feeling very open at that time and wasn't really protecting my field, so to say. My energy wasn't going there. It was going towards getting through the day. And there is this, when when a person is passing um, those final days, it is, it's like, it's this very weird in-between space that you can feel. It's very tangible. I just got chills. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's similar to birth. I mean, yeah, because- it's very, it's very, it's, it's very, it's that rainbow bridge. It's almost like we're in the rainbow with them in, in those times. And all of these spirits and, and our ancestors are so accessible at that time and it, it is something that is so indescribable. And if you have the ability and the awareness to drop into that space and go beyond you, your personal pain and actually sit in the honest and the awareness of, wow, this person is actually not leaving. They're simply transitioning into something different that will still be accessible to me. What it sounds to me like you guys are talking about is Bardos. I don't know what that so Our Bardos means, but... is in Tibetan Buddhism. Bardo is the state of the soul between death and rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. So have you taken like that experience into other areas of your life or other times since mm-hmm. since that experience? Absolutely. And I, I'm not sure if it's just the state of affairs of what's happening in the world now, you know, just my own personal life experience or just gifts bestowed upon me since my grandfather's passing. Um, but because I've been able to now sit in that space, I'm able to easily recognize it in other areas of my life. And like Violet was sharing, there are moments, affirmations that are just impossible to ignore that. Oh my gosh. For instance, with my grandmother, it's owls and rainbows. And with my grandfather, I know it's geese now. Anytime I see geese, it's, it, they always show up at the right time. Now I'm even able to have conversation, clear conversations with my grandfather and my grandmother and, and feel, you can almost feel that space in other areas and other times of your life. So, um, 
I definitely can hear them a lot clearer now in prayer, meditation, or in my dreams. Yeah, something that Tara said on the last episode um, was about learning a new language when you yes. Oh, yeah, with she people. sure did. That yes. is a good way to put that for yeah. sure. Yes, I for sure feel <laughs> I feel more with my grandfather now than I did when he was alive. So. Um, my granddaughter actually shared something beautiful with me the other day, and I was crying thinking about, actually, yesterday marks a two-year anniversary of losing a cousin, and we were crying and thinking about this, and she was like, Chi-Chi, those tears on your face, that is his love. Oh, mm. that is beautiful. Yes, and it reminded me of a quote, and I, I don't remember the specific quote, but it was something about how grief is like a friend. You know, it's like that friend that doesn't leave you. So even in our sadness, like we think it's that we're missing that person. But what I feel so much is that sadness is actually, they're actually there in that moment with us, sitting with us. Mm, That's a great way to think of that. It reminds me of, um, it just came to me about when my grandfather, um, he had passed on quite a few years prior and I was having a really dark night of the soul and I was basically kind of that jumping off place where I didn't want to be here anymore. It was my birthday. I remember I was just consumed with this pain and I opened my eyes uh, briefly, uh, you know, billowing tears and things like that. And, um, and I saw my grandfather there on the sitting right on the couch close to my bed And it was just like he was really there. And I remember him saying, just, he just enveloped me with this love. And he just said, there's nothing that could make you unworthy of all the love in this world. Like you, that this, there's an unconditional love that is just pouring out to you. And you deserve life and you deserve love. And it was just this energetic feeling that washed over me. And it was like, I don't know, I felt okay. And I think my point of telling you about that is that I've had quite a few experiences. Those aren't the only two that were kind of like smaller uh, right after uh, a a close friend passed and um, experiences with after death. So I have a little icebreaker question for each of you if you could take something with you into the afterlife that is not a person what would it be well the very first thing that came to mind immediately without even putting any thought into it is a blanket <laughs> I love that. I, I, we, we have that in common <laughs> it's a blanket um, That's so awesome. Oh my gosh. Pillow. Every, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. A blanket. And the reason for that is um, I, I always have a blanket with me everywhere I go. I'm surprised I don't have, but I didn't bring up, I almost brought a blanket in with me in here. Um, you could have. I could have. Yeah. I thought about it. Um when my my early childhood, um, my parents remarried and all of my stuff was gone. And the one thing that I had got to keep was a blanket. And it was a blanket that my grandmother had sewn for me, the same grandmother I've been talking about. Um, and I reconnect, got to reconnect with them, obviously, again, years later. But I kept that blanket with me. And to this day, I always still have a blanket. So that's mm-hmm. awesome. I like that. I'm, I'm a blanket person. Mm-hmm. To me, they hold energy, you know, and she sews blankets and stuff. And so it just to me and I'll hold a blanket that I have this son, a blanket that my son slept in when he was a baby. And I still have that around my house. And yeah, that's great. How about you, Violet? First thing that came to mind was one of my rocks, my crystals. Um, I carry them. They, they're like a security blanket for me. <laughs> um, and I feel like I could travel lightly with one and it would still be like my, you know, friend. And can you tell us what kind of, um, you know, it just dif- differs. Um, but you know, 
Um, I was, for some reason in my mind, it was just like one of the long, tall ones with the point at the top and you could just hold it in your hand or you could put it like wherever you need it to be. Like if you have a pocket, I don't know if in death you have pockets. (laughs) (laughs) You have everything. Skin pockets maybe. But it would fit right here, you know, (laughs) we're going through the wormhole or wherever we gotta go. You can have a pocket like the little otters do. Uh Maybe, like a little pouch. Yeah. You've seen the otters play with the rocks and they <laughs> put it under your arm. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's just like a crystal that would, uh, you know, I would feel connected to that would have extra energy that we could collaborate with. I like that. What about you, Jennifer? I actually thought of a crystal wand. That was like what popped into my head. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of cool. You can use that for a lot of different things or just to dance with. So, <laughs> so it says not a person. My little dog, my Aww. little chihuahua dog. I have three, but my, I have an affinity for little dogs. Um, they're always they're rescues, like, though. It's so. like a heart yes. next to you. Yes. I mean, that's how I think about them. Yeah. You just get to hold their heart. Kaya. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for being here and sharing your story with us. And it was really beautiful. Yes, we really do appreciate you taking your time out of the day and coming sharing your stories with us they're beautiful thank you so much for allowing us space to share those stories because they are you know um very unique to us and special and um just talking about it really brought back a lot of emotion and uh, energy you know I could feel just this power that came from that experience that I'll get to keep with me forever and I hope to share that you know with you guys um Because it was very real. I love how our experiences with death really make life more vivid and Mm -hmm. and deep. Yeah. Yes. If if there's anything I I I could say about my experience with that is it brought me so much more meaning to life, to my own life, to um, have had the honor and the privilege to be there with my grandfather in his final moments, and to have experienced that with him. And with my other family members, too. Like, we're forever bonded through that experience together. And I will forever be changed as to how I see death. And will help ease the transition for, for my own, preparing for my own mm-hmm. death. And, the you know, and, and it's opened up conversations with my children and preparations and what I would like. And it's very much normalized death for us in our home as, as something to prepare and and and. And not be so um, scared of the unknown. That's, That's beautiful. Our, That's our mission. That is our mission. Yep. Yeah. Let's get everybody talking yeah, about it. Yeah. So I thank you so much for doing the work that you guys do and and allowing these conversations to happen. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being a part of it. Stay tuned for our next episode where we continue to delve deeper into the mysteries of death. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as we journey through life's most enigmatic reality. I'm Jennifer O'Neill. And I'm Sarah Kovash. And we are the The Death Death Doula Doula Duo. Duo. The Death Doula Duo is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform. If you have comments, suggestions, or would like to be on the show, please email us at thedeathdouladuo at gmail.com. Until next time, may all your discussions about death be lively. (laughs) 